This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with J.T. Ravasse, who has spent the last 20 years fighting to authenticate a collection of Jackson Pollock paintings that could represent a missing period in the artist's work. We discuss the difficult process for authenticating any found piece of art, but especially the work of this particular artist. Regardless of whether or not you're a Pollock fan, it's an interesting story with no easy answers. So, JT Ravaze, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast this week. Uh, JT, we, I first met you uh, at an art event in LA, and... Um, I was amazed by what you had uh, because it looked just like a Jackson Pollock. And when I asked you, what is this? Your response was a Jackson Pollock. And then my head kind of spun. And um, JT, can you kind of explain to us, you know, what what we're looking what we are looking at with uh, the Wyoming Working Group? What what is it that you 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 have your hands on? Um, thank you very much for having me on your show today, Craig. It was a pleasure to meet you. And uh, as I've said to you before, I I never ever expected to be talking about this in public. I always thought it was going to be kind of a under the radar, low key thing, and uh, just the way things have worked out uh, over 20 years now, which is unbelievable but true. Coming up in April it will be 20 years that I've been researching this group of paintings along with my wife, and uh, we are the business entity Wyoming Working Group, and we just picked that name because Jackson Pollock was born in Wyoming, and so seemed appropriate. And uh, we live in uh, Zephyr Cove, Nevada, which is on the Nevada side of Lake Tahoe. And uh, my wife and I are pretty well known for doing landscape books, and her poetry is nationally recognized. Um, And we do landscape uh, photography and poetry about Lake Tahoe, and that is generally used as an advocacy tool uh, using art. Uh, poetry, photography to advocate on behalf of Lake Tahoe uh, in Washington, D.C. And every day that we're here in Lake Tahoe, we just want people to take care of the place. And so we do our best to celebrate it with our books. And that's our, as I say, our day job. And then what's turned into night school of at least Ph.D. one or two with respect to Jackson Pollock and his life and career and history and market Uh, it's just something that a friend of mine, you know, it started 20 years ago by a friend of mine saying, Hey, I'm talking to this guy and his neighbor has some paintings by a guy named Pollock or something. And it literally started. And I said, you maybe Pollock. And he goes, I don't know. He says Pollock and which the old guy with his accent, how he used to say it, Jackson Pollock. And uh, so anyway, that's how I started. And they said, hey, can you go down and take a look? His, his rancher neighbor has been kind of poking around for three or four years. And, and you know, it's obviously, it's obvious when you look at the paintings on the wall and then look at Pollock's books and catalog resume, that it's most likely Pollock. And what's going on here? And uh, you have a lot more experience in the art world than this other guy. So why don't you take a look? And that's basically how it started in April of 2002. And I went down with my wife, Linda, and looked at four paintings. And even though I didn't know that much about Jackson Pollock at the time, more than you know your average art interested person, uh, I had been studying fractals, which are patterns in nature I didn't know they were called fractals at the time. I was just interested in patterns in nature. And by studying them for a quarter of a century, I just 
come to understand patterns of nature. And so when I saw the paintings initially, it struck me that it wasn't random chaos that your cat or dog or five-year-old kid could do, that there was something going on. And that's basically how it uh, started. And so at this point in time, you know, we're in, uh, in Lake Tahoe and I have amassed probably one of the world's best collections of Jackson Pollock literature, research, ephemera, books, exhibitions, catalogs, et cetera, just studying what this is all about. And so the bottom line is, is that a, a gentleman had a large collection of drip pour Pollock masterworks that he had for 50 years, the same consistent story. I got them from uh, a girlfriend, not Ruth Klingman, a girlfriend or a friend that was a girl of Jackson Pollock's named Helen. And basically that was the, the story that there was a, a young artist named Helen, which uh, this is definitely part of the unraveling of this story and the peeling the onion layers, et cetera, is there was always a name Helen Rodfield, but the, the as you know, this person who uh, was a friend of Pollock's lived in Greenwich Village um, and that was the connection but the, the, the closer I got to this guy's passing in 2014, this uh, Mr. Nemeth uh, was his name. And the, the, the older, you know, more we got into this and the closer to his passing that he got, the more he would say Helen Frankenthaler. And so I, even after 20 years, don't know if this collection was going through the hands of two different Helens or Helen Rodfield, which has always been like in the literature and in the stories and everything, or if it was also, or really it was Helen Frankenthaler. So there's just the basic story, whole bunch of paintings that this lady had that Jackson Pollock had placed with her pre prior to the, um, about to happen biggest museum show of his life which had been given to him in 1956 by the board of directors at new york moma uh, nelson rockefeller at the time was the the chair of the board and they had something going on where they said well we want to do a series of midlife retrospectives and we're going to start our finalists are picasso motherwell and pollock and they chose pollock which brings up a really important part of this whole thing, which is the disconnect or disinformation that exists with respect to what Pollock was doing the last three, four years of his life. And it's one of the first questions out of the box is why would the board of directors of the prestigious New York Museum of you know, Modern Art, New York MoMA, give a show, Midlife Retrospective, to a guy that future tellings of his story in life, mostly Lee Krasner, were, oh yeah, he was just drunk and he wasn't doing anything from 1953 to 56. A guy who had painted 40 to 50 paintings a year. And then he just, nope, uh, he only painted 15 paintings. That's what's recorded in the catalog resume that was put together by Lee Krasner um, kind of, you know, anointing and appointing, um, you know, Francis O'Connor and Eugene Thaw to do a four-year process between 1975 and 1978 to pull together the, you know, quote-unquote catalog resume. This is what we know of Jackson Pollock's, you know, career and life output. Um, I've come to think of it much more as an exercise of exclusion rather than an exercise of inclusion with respect to the paintings that they included, uh, which, you know, they picked them, they wrote it, they photographed it, Yale University Press printed it in 1978, but it's, it's the life of Jackson Pollock uh, according to their, you know, vision, their agenda. And so in my 20 year process of researching, what I've really found is that 
there is, you know, quite a bit of a disconnect from the popular version that's been advanced over the last 50 years and is very institutionalized by now, whether it's, you know, reference books or college textbooks or whatever, you know, here is the story of Jackson Pollock's life and that's the way it is. And uh, I would just have to beg, I would beg to differ. Um, so anyway, um, you know, they, they put this document together, but I don't believe that it's accurate. I believe that something else was going on. Uh, all of this is informed by 20 years of research. Uh, I believe that Jackson Pollock was collecting or segregating a body of work from which he was going to make his final polls for the show that was scheduled to take place in November of 1956. Um, there was, uh, you know, what this collection constitutes or is made up of is a remarkable and, and large, huge. Uh, I've been tracking it down, you know, the story and the people and the paintings, and there's at least a hundred of, of, you know, some of the best, our absolute best drip for paintings of Pollock's life that the story is he hand selected and had, you know, with this younger artist friend girl, Helen, and nobody expected him on August 11th, 1956 to die in a car crash, but he did. And this young gal all of a sudden had a large stash of Pollock drip for paintings. And the FBI interviewed Mr. Nemeth twice in uh, 2012 about the story, the paintings. Did you paint them, all that? And he's like, no, I didn't paint them. I did. I'd be famous and rich and everything. They're just a group of paintings that I got. And um, they came to me through a friend of the Helen or Helen's. And, uh, and that was it. Um, you know, and so... The FBI interviewed him twice and said, okay, they didn't find any reason to go any further and, and you know, question his story. Or, you know, they, they did their own research and came back with, well, okay, looks like what the guy's saying is accurate. So it's, it's really odd, you know, that no, well, especially Eugene Thon and Francis O'Connor, who were, you know, the godfathers, you know, for sure, of the entire Pollock world and art market and kind of everything Pollock for many, many years from the mid seventies uh, until their passing in, you know, 2018. I mean, they were the ultimate arbiter. They, they were um, the guys that you wanted to have and weigh in one way or the other. If you really cared about somebody, um, you know, weighing in and giving their appraisal or perspective or connoisseurship, um, they were the ones and, and we spent well over a decade trying to get both of either Eugene Thaw and in the case of Francis O'Connor more than 15 years, um, no, it's both, both of them were, were 15 years or more to come to the table with, you know, no, uh, no set parameters. Like we just want you to come and look at these paintings and say what you want to say. And they would not do it. And, uh, so anyway. Uh, it's like, well, uh, okay, if they're not going to do it, that's really odd. And how else would you go about the process of attempting to authenticate something that uh, there was no formal authentication board for uh, due to its having uh, disbanded in 1996 uh, at the time, uh, Bill Lieberman, Francis O'Connor, Eugene Thaw, Ellen Landau, you know, comprised that Jackson Pollock authentication board from 1984 to 1996. It's my view and opinion after all these years that they knew most or all about this story in this collection. Um, I believe, well, there's so many different tangents and I, I'm hoping that We'll just kind of get into this and, and have a discussion today that we'll follow up on because this really is a gigantic, huge story. The, the bottom line of which is 
um, you know, are these authentic Jackson Pollock? And there's, we've done two and a half million dollars worth of research with the top scientists in the world since 2003. The answer invariably is, well, of course they are. If it wasn't Jackson Pollock, they would have been authenticated a long time ago. This is what, you know, politics and market influence and all of that is about. Sure. Um, so, may so maybe that's a good place to, to kind of back up and, and kind of um, explain to people what the situation is for trying to authenticate any painting that you want to sell as what you say it is. If you have provenance, so uh, a chain, you know, a direct chain of lineage um, that usually that's the best course and that usually results in that painting being listed in what's called the catalog raisonné. And the catalog raisonné for any particular artist is usually completed by some board of authorities on that particular ar artist and yeah. it is hopeful to be a complete cataloging of everything that's been verified to be real and if it's if it's in the catalog and you can match your painting to what's in the catalog then you have a seal of approval but what you, you have you have a start you have a start and, right and but, what i have is is on the in the in the world of jackson pollock that it is an intentionally dysfunctional authentication mechanism which is forward for saying it's it's their business plan it's how they control the market it's how they control paintings um you know part of the documentation we have with this is that the the helen person and the person who bought them and acquired them from this helen started buying work from her in 1955 while pollock was alive and started buying canvases from Pollock. Pollock was well known for selling stuff, bartering stuff, selling it to the neighbors, groceries, etc. And on any artist, it's extremely difficult to say with any certainty and conviction and truth, oh yeah, this is by, you know, we know for sure this is the entire life's output of the artist. It's just impossible. And even Eugene Thaw and Francis O'Connor say it in the catalog resume. They say, you know, we're sure that at least 6% of Pollock's work is unaccounted for. And so in 1978, when they said that, that would have been about 70 paintings. But it's, it's much bigger and different than that. And to me, you know, as I go back, my question is, I'm positive that Lee Krasner knew, I'm positive after 20 years of research and checking it out, I'm positive that Lee Krasner knew that there was another large collection out there and that a lot of what she did between 1956 and 1984 when she passed away was just kind of manage and tell the Pollock story the way she wanted to. There's no questioning that Pollock was a pain in the ass um, and a difficult guy to be around, get along with, whatever. So, you know, their famous uh, relationship of of, of fighting and hassling and whatever is is what it is um, but I don't think that Lee Krasner wanted this other I know it I, I know she didn't want this other work being known about because she didn't control it uh, it's that simple um, you know another thing about this with this large you know body of work is that you know the top world art forensic people uh, have looked you know a lot of them and, you know, invariably the comments are, you know, oh my God. And on some of them, including one of them that I'm going to have up on the wall at the LA Art Show 2022 coming up uh, January 19th to the 23rd. Um, there's one I'm going to have on the wall that in our classification system we call C as in Charlie 8. And it's 13 and a half feet long. And it's hands down one of the best things he ever did and and frequently i've had comments of that's one of the four or five greatest masterworks by any artist in the 20th century and so any painting that's part of this kind of group each painting has to go through the process of examination scientific testing connoisseurship 
you know, nobody's giving them a pass. If anything, as one uh, early forensic art scientist said in 2007, who is a, an extremely influential person in the art world, said, I'll bet these turn out to be some of the most studied research paintings ever in the history of art. And I was like, okay, whatever. So um, anyway, the process of authentication is difficult enough anyway if you don't have the airtight provenance, which, you know, acknowledge, uh, we acknowledge on this is not that airtight. If it was, we'd be selling a billion dollars worth of, two billion dollars worth of Jackson Pollock stuff, no questions. Um, but, you know, it is a question, but I also believe that it's a question that there's an answer to, and that by finally going more public now and going to the public and saying, hey, our target audience is about 80 to 95 years old. And who might know something about this? Somebody has to know. Well, well, we know a number of people know about it, but who knows a lot about this and is willing to talk about it on the record? So, you know, that's the issue now. And, and you're helping the process of the paintings tell the story. I'm just a guy who started this research thing with my wife 20 years ago. And, and this thing's been dragging us all over. I, I often say it's kind of like the old man in the sea where the old man catches this great fish and then it drags him around, you know, the Caribbean for three days. And he's like, oh, my God, what did I hook into? Uh, so that totally is true on this. We had, we had no idea. I thought there were four paintings when I started this. And even that would have been amazing. And one of the very first people I went to was Amy Meyer whose husband, Jack Meyer, at the time was number two at the Getty, and she was in charge of some department, paintings, whatever, at the Huntington. And now I believe she is back at, is it Yale University? Anyway, just somebody I need to reconnect with because 20 years ago, due to my having worked with her previously on another art project, I went to her, and she said this comment, and I'll never forget, it was June 18, 2002, having lunch down there in Los Angeles, I was like, Amy, I got this kind of, you know, weird thing, whatever, just, I got this thing. This guy, you know, has some old Pollux, you know, how do we go about the process of authenticating and making this happen? And one of her comments was, don't expect them to be happy about this. And then, you know, I'm going and thinking, wow, how cool, Four Jackson Pollux, they're like national treasures. This is amazing. And her, she immediately gave me some of the best advice and that was don't expect them to be happy about this and i had no you could have been talking greek to me i didn't i didn't get it at all and uh, 20 years later i'm like oh okay i get it so um it's a it's a huge white elephant in the room 800 pound gorilla whatever you want to call it but at this point we really are going public with it to find out what the real answers are that can be um, dug up and, and still exist with either living people or very odd things like Clement Greenberg in the mid 80s, leaving a box with a Southern California institution saying, this is not to be opened until 30 years after the death of Helen Frankenthaler. And, and Clement Greenberg passed away in the 80s, and, and Helen Frankenthaler, who we threw uh, a cutout, tried to get to talk a bit, and she wouldn't. Um, but there's, I, it just keeps coming back to that. There is well, some. Sure. Can, yeah, I mean, you know, Frankenthaler. Um, dated Greenberg mid fifties. She wound up marrying Motherwell. Um, uh -huh. It was you know uh, known to be you know to have some sort of uh, at least professional sort of relationship with Pollock. I mean, it's it, it's touching all the right you know all the right notes there. But it, let me back up for a second. If you know, and going back to the question of you know, well, how does someone go about? authenticating a painting, you know, say, um, you know, somebody were to show up at a garage sale and buy something that happens to be a Van Gogh, 
right? You, the, you that bet. you know how how does someone go about um, you know authenticating and getting a seal of approval? And typically, yeah. and typically, yeah. what what happens is the, there's you know an assessment of a artistically does it fit? B is there some reference to the painting in the journals or whatever? Uh, then it's a, a question of material sciences, right? Um, is is the canvas correct for the period? Is the canvas lucky enough to actually match another canvas uh, because they they were torn from the same bolt of fabric? Uh, are there stamps or or labels on the back from where it went through uh, a particular uh, gallery or house? Uh, the, is the paint consistent? You know, the more modern a paint is, the more synthetics are in there that just wouldn't be period appropriate. And I feel like, you know, if you kind of triangulate all that, you can come up with, you can make a case, but at the end of the day that, you know, who who's to say? Well, it, typically it's the people that are putting together the catalog resume. And if that if that person is willing to say, Yes, you know, you've stated your case well and we, you know, we have that authority to say that that would to agree, then you get the stamp of approval, but sometimes this, you can have all the yeah. all the evidence but still not get the stamp. And so can you kind well, of Well, that goes this goes back sorry to interrupt, but it just it, it's there. Um this goes back to the whole concept of, you know, authentication in general, but specifically Pollock going back to that, you know, little statement of intentionally dysfunctional authentication mechanism. The the Polly Krasner Foundation recused themselves, you know, years ago from deciding to weigh in on authentication matters. And I, I honestly believe it was because of this large collection. They were just between a rock and a hard place. And it was better for them just to deny, deny, deny and not try and look at something which is you know a comment i had from several of the top art forensic world experts who went and said you know hey we're interested in finding out some answers and some research and what's interesting is that originally authentication was you know mostly the scholarship connoisseurship angle that's all you could do and it was only about the year 2000 really that scientific technologies became available that would allow someone uh, to take a parallel track of authentication, which was, well, in absence of perfect provenance, in absence of a catalog resume board of experts that want to weigh in on it, uh, what are you left with? Well, you're left with attempting to create a case of fact that you can present to a court of law or the court of public opinion and just say, hey, you know what, 20 years, millions of dollars of research, here's what we've found. Uh, we know that the real answer is out there and kind of that's the part of the, the research phase now, which is now it's like open source. Um, it's like, okay, uh, um, you know, good, bad or ugly. Um, you know, who has something legitimate that can be confirmed that they want to contribute to this question, this discussion. Um, you know, the, the different parts of the authentication question and case that we're putting together, as you mentioned, it includes materials analysis. So you're analyzing the paint, you're analyzing the support, you're analyzing the canvas. Is the canvas weave something that the artist has used before? Absolutely, definitely. There are several different canvas weaves in and among the, the paintings that have, that, you know, comprise this large group. And in the large group, there are canvas, paintings on paper, paintings on masonite, paintings on artboard, predominantly canvas and paper. Um, but, you know, that's the, the the case that we're putting together is materials. Um, then it's the whole thing of connoisseurship. How does it compare with specific examples from the catalog resume? Um, and then the whole question, which in 2007, we started before even one single reference or mention of it had ever been done, which is the whole thing about trying, trying to figure out DNA match. 
and what really is involved with that. And we were just literally too soon. Um, you know, so much has changed and evolved since 2007 with respect to the knowledge collection, testing bodies of evidence out there that can be accessed. And so I really find myself in a place now of going back to the drawing board after 20 years and saying, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? We're going to, we're going for it now. So to put together, you know, a body of evidence that everybody or most 99% of the people in the world can agree on, you'll always have some doubters and whatever. It's just, especially with Pollock. Um, you're just trying to put all of that together. And the DNA thing is a huge question for us. And part of our process of being stonewalled and rebuffed and ignored or suppressed by the Pollock Krasner Foundation, because we have attorneys letters from over a decade saying, excuse me, you've allowed many other experts to go and sample the floor, photograph things, look for paint samples, look for DNA hair samples, why are you excluding us? And uh, so anyway, um, I really do find myself, you know, unbelievably at this juncture of like, okay, well, what have we actually accomplished? What do we need to accomplish? We need to accomplish the authentication of the group as a whole and to bring them out um, and, and more than attributed to Jackson Pollock. They deserve, or at least all the ones that, you know, pass the test. They deserve to be recognized as original Jackson Pollocks and included in his life work because many of these, getting back to the whole concept of was this, a, you know, a hand pulled by Pollock, because the ages of these paintings range from early ones, meaning early drip pour, 45, 46, 47, well, even earlier than that, you know, the very first stuff. In the catalog resonate, there's something called the 1943 it was something about the galaxy where you start to see a little bit of the drip war and then 46, 47, especially is, you know, full on here's, here's this thing I'm doing. Um, so, you know, there are paintings in this overall group that are from early in the career. And then you can, you can totally match up stuff with 49, 50, 51, 52. And then it's our contention that a lot of this collection is 52 to 56 and part of that story is the arrival of Clifford Still into the, the hood, as it is, the Springs, um, back in 1951. And this is a really interesting reference point. This is something you wouldn't have known before 2011. Uh, Clifford Still, unbeknownst to everybody except his wife, during his life only sold 6% of his work and kept over 2,000 pieces that, you know, for the people that are familiar with it, that he left with the wife with instructions, hey, if you go to a major city that will build me a gallery to my specifications, got to have skylights, you know, can't have a cafeteria, can't show anybody else, you know, whatever specific things he had, if they do that and build me a, a museum, I'll give them all the work. And so it was Atlanta and maybe Philadelphia and whatever, and, and Denver actually wound up winning. And there's an interesting correlation. I mentioned this in the, you know, the only public lecture I've ever given on this at the LAR show back in, in 2020, February 7th, um, that there is an exact correlation with the arrival of Clifford Still, who was famous for thumping about, oh my God, forget you know the galleries, forget the museums, forget the collectors, we're, we paint because we're artists, we do this because that's who we are, it's what we do, you know? And so, it, it, there is, you know, for the scholars, a real point there of, uh, was it in fact Pollock drunk or just not painting 53 to 56, or with the influence of Clifford Still, did he start to become much more selective about, hey, he's totally right. I'm painting this because I like painting. I'm, you know, this is what I, I do. This is who I am. I don't. You know, in fact, I, I, I'm on record as not being too happy with my gallery, you know, reps and museums and the whole thing. So there is a, in my opinion, formed by 20 years, a real correlation. And I believe there are answers to be found there in the relationship between Clifford Still and Jackson Pollock and the whole thing about 
saving, giving paintings away, etc. You know, uh, Jackson Pollock's first, um, you know, serious rep, uh, Peggy Guggenheim, you know, their contract from 43 to 47, I think it was $1,500 a year. And she, the contract said, got every finished painting that Pollock did in a year with the exception of one that he could pull. And to me, it was a, a very good explanation of why so much of Jackson Pollock's work is unsigned is that if you have uh, a contract with Peggy Guggenheim that says she gets every sign, every finished painting that you do in a year, it's pretty easy to just go, well, I'm still working on it. I haven't signed it. I mean, you know, I pull these up after six months. Maybe I want to add a few more squiggles, whatever. So anyway, that's another kind of aside about Pollock and his work and, and how much of it is signed or unsigned. Um, but, but going back to the whole thing of, I'll, I'll keep saying that there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect with the standard story that's been told that was told initially by Lee Krasner and now kind of is just like institutional memory um, and what really happened in 53, 56. And so, you know, you're definitely treading on sacred ground there. You know, you're definitely, yeah, you're treading on, uh, you know, hallowed ground. And so, you know, there's there's a tremendous amount of resistance. And uh, but the odd thing is, is it's not in public. You know, it's what's gone on behind the scenes for the last 20 years. Uh, that is, uh, I don't know if you know Ronan Farrow, but uh, maybe you'll listen or maybe a, a friend knows it. I, I think it would be a remarkable story and research project for him to check out and or somebody like that um, because you know as this comes to light and in and, and in 2010 2011 you know we had harry moses of 60 minutes you know fame and and his you know being a legendary producer there who became interested in this through one of the forensic scientists who said hey you know harry you did that movie what the bleep is uh you know, who the bleep is Jackson Pollock or the one single painting. Well, this is that like times a hundred. And so we had the, the, you know, the nice experience of having Harry come out several times to Lake Tahoe to look at stuff, to actually have a one hour interview with the source, our source of all these paintings and the guy who for 50 years had them, uh, this Mr. Nemeth, that's never been seen. And it would be a really amazing thing, actually, I just thought to right now, hey, we should actually have some of the some of that on this show. Um, there is remarkable stuff that Harry in a, you know, face to face, chair to chair, one hour filmed interview uh, with Mr. Nemeth, who same kind of thing was, you know, re very reticent uh, to talk and appear on camera and all that kind of thing. Um, so. He, there's some awesome information there. Um, and, and that's the type of thing that, you know, Harry Moses was all set. He found half a million dollar grant for this to be, you know, filmed. And it was supposed to be with that Da Vinci La Bella Principessa. And it was supposed to be a half hour on La Bella Principessa and, and half hour on our thing of like, here, art questions. And when the, the powers that be, and remember, this was Nova, PBS, and we even went to the National Geographic headquarters in D.C. and said, hey, got this project. Are you interested in international distribution? And they, you know, after about five minutes, were like, hell yes. And so it was one of a number of times when we saw the power of the political influence, the pull of the people uh, you know, Eugene Thaw, friends of Garner, associated with Pollock, where one day we had a half million dollar grant and the next day it was like, oh, sorry, they pulled your money. <laughs> and I'm mean, like, Harry, what happened? He goes, I'm not really sure. I'm trying to find out an answer. I've never really had this happen before. And uh, so, you know, once again, a, 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 a side discussion for a, for a future podcast. But anyway, somebody that we have you know, 15 years, once, once we did our first year and a half of research, because that's how our research pro process went, is that we heard about this in April and said, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. 
Um, but then the more we started doing research over a year and a half, the more that the answers kept coming back. It's Pollock, it's Pollock, it's Pollock, it's Pollock. And we're like, dang, uh, okay. And so that's when we started to understand a fraction of the magnitude of this and started interviewing and, and videoing with a professional cinematographer with the hopes of someday using it for a documentary or a movie or a PBS special or whatever um, footage. We have years of really amazing stuff that needs a really good editor and film person to put it together. And then you need a good, you know, story writer, you know, Ronan Farrell ish, as far as doing like, you know, expose, you know, here's, you know, controversial, blah, 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 you know, whatever. And, and I just say his name because he did the, the, the Weinstein and, you know, as it, it, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> I'll just tell you. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, so. You know, you can look at it a couple of different ways. I mean, at some point, uh, I'm sure, you, you know, folks would love to be able to to monetize on the fact that that these pieces are able to be authenticated. But in from like an art historical perspective, right, if if these really are by the person we think that you and you know you're making the case that I'm 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 buying in that it, that if these really are by Pollock they they aren't just paintings by Jackson Pollock they are some of the if not the best paintings by Pollock and it would be an injustice for his best work if the fact exists that these are by him yeah, absolutely. right Absolutely. And, you know, we, we had uh, Steve Rubino, who's a famous uh, attorney, and a guy named Rob DeBrower, who was actually on a trustee on the board of uh, State University, you know, uh, Stony Brook, who actually owns the Pollock Krasner, I mean, the, you know, the Jackson Pollock Painting Studio. You know, they own it. And then the, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, you know, leases it or uses it or whatever. Um, but they went and had a conversation with her, and she just said, no, nope, not interested. And they're like, aren't you interested in who these paintings are from? Because they certainly appear to be some of the best Pollocks, among the best Pollocks ever. Um, uh, and or if it wasn't Pollock, who was it? And they, she was just totally shut them down. It's like, nope, not interested. We just, you know, we've recused ourselves from authentication matters, which is a lame cop out. And, uh, and that's just how we're doing stuff right now. And that was probably in 2000. 14-ish, 15-ish. I, I can find out the exact time. Um, but, you know, that was their just attitude. It's like, nope, sorry, uh, we're not interested. We don't, we, we don't want to upset our version of the world. You know, our version of the Pollock world is flat, and you say it's this. No, we're just not interested. And so that's, and they said, you know, is that a responsible response for somebody who's, you know, allegedly the flame keeper the the guardian per se of pollock the career and and the body of work so it's a re it's a tough tough equation and question for everyone involved which is why it's been easy for everybody to ignore it sweep it under the rug intentionally suppress it what have you um and so but you know now is time and it was time 10 years ago like I said, if I understood that I would be where I am now today, 10 years ago, I would have been doing this 10 years ago. But I was very happy with the thing of like, I just want to be in the background. This really is a huge, remarkable collection. We've already done the couple million dollars of homework. It's, you know, if it's not every single one of these paintings in this collection, then it is the vast majority of them. And that's just giving the nod to you have to ask the question you know where some of these like just slipped in whatever and it's like fine I, i'm you know that's reality everything has to prove itself um so but the the Pollock krasner foundation has definitely been about ignore and suppress and uh and and they're in a no-win situation too because it's like well uh for us to acknowledge that would would mean that somehow we have to admit that at what point in time 
did we really know about this? And according to the forensic scientists that talk in closed door sessions with them, it's at least since the 70s. So it's it's a very difficult equation to figure out how do you do this without you know destroying the artist without destroying the artist's wife who was hiding this stuff who came back from europe a couple days after the car crash and found a document that was a whole bunch of paintings and inventory in jackson pollock's own handwriting and look at it and say what the f where the heck are all these and so, oh, it's, uh, it, anyway, it has to be done. I, I just really uh, never thought I would be here. <laughs> right. So. so if, if people wanted to, uh, if people wanted to know more, um, they can actually come see some of the work in person this week at the LA Art Show, correct? It, 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 today is the, we're, we're doing this interview on the 10th and the show starts on wednesday january 19th and runs through sunday for anybody you know in the la or west coast you know awesome road trip omicron omicrud is really just the latest freaking hassle uh, of all of this but seeing the paintings in person is the best strongest argument for their authenticity and i I know that uh, you have a magnifying glass uh, at oh, hand yeah. to... uh, it's, fun. it's totally fine it's, it's, you would never get a chance to get up close and personal with these paintings like in a museum like you would seeing in the booth the other thing is that you know www.wyomingworkinggroup.com and you just have to type it in the google search bar because we don't even have it distributed to search engines but if you go to www.wyomingworkinggroup.com you know, the start of the story is there, <clears throat> excuse me, and only in the last year have we put that up as kind of an informational tool. And because we're still trying to decide, you know, what's better, a documentary, a, a book, a catalog, a, how do you do this? And literally the whole conversation started with a phone conversation between myself and Eugene Thaw in October of 2002 where I called up IFAR, International Fine Art Research, and just said, hey, I hear, you know, the Paul Krasner Foundation is not doing authentication anymore. There's no Texas Pollock Authentication Board. Uh, I'm trying to do some homework. And uh, what do I do? And he said, well, you know, send us 1500 bucks for painting and everything you know about it and all of the information, and we'll uh, do a report. And then I said, which I probably shouldn't have, uh, isn't it? true, Mr. Thaw, that at least with respect to Pollock, that when you produce an authentication report, that the people writing the the report don't have to sign their name. And doesn't that mean really that there's absolutely no accountability? And I said that word for word. And then there was a silence on the phone that seemed like forever. It's probably 10 seconds. And he was just like, well, you know, that's one way to look at it. And uh, and that was it. And and I wish, you know, I had been more Dale Carnegie tactful uh, at the time because I think what we did there was tell him who the most recent person attempting to authenticate this large group of paintings was. Because the more, you know, I have definitely evidence of them looking at and saying, we just don't know uh, from the seventies onward. So anyway, um, go to go and see there's, uh, there's some story, uh, there's paintings, there's some of the, there's some video um, and it's great just to look at them because they really are remarkable. And by far for anybody who's able to, and thanks for giving me this platform because I want to do, I want to partner with somebody and do a touring museum show. And the, and the question is, do you call it the paintings from the 1956, you know, MoMA show that you never saw or the, or the, the museum show that never was, you know, or something like that, that is, hey, guys, look at this astounding work. 
for fans of Pollock. You know, there are you know definitely lots of people who are like, yeah, Pollock, Schmollock, who cares? But for people who like Pollock, love Pollock, um, they're cool. I mean, you stood in front of them. They're Absolutely. pretty amazing. They are. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen my share of, um, of people who have tried to emulate drip paintings and, um, you know, and that's, that's one of the things they talk about, you know, the, the first litmus test and whether a work is actually as authentic is, you know, a gut test. And that's the reason you that, the that, blink. The yeah. yeah, the 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 people who are immersed in a particular artist, they they don't need you, the whole story. They can tell you right off the bat this, you know, this feels right, this looks right. And you know, I'm not the world's uh, biggest Pollock um, authority, but um, you know, from my perspective, um, it's very very compelling and. Um, and JT, I I really appreciate you you being willing to to share your time this afternoon to to tell your story because it, it um, and you know I I, uh, I just hope that you know going forward we can we can find a path for you to um, break down some of uh, some of those walls um, because you know it, um, it you know uh, it like I said you know earlier if uh, if these are what we think they are. Uh, we owe it to Pollock to to set the record straight so that people can appreciate the work the the way his uh, his other work has been appreciated. And because it adds to his you know life story and it adds to his body of work in a good way. Um, you know they're just flat out remarkable pieces. You know from the smallest little guys, which uh, I think you have two that are. 16 by 20 that I believe are some of the very first drip pour things you ever did on this artboard thing with paint can circles on the back of them. I mean, there's as, as historical national treasure objects, but it's the big ones. This thing, C8, there's another one called C2, and all those are on the, the website where you can just pull up, and I'm going to be adding to that. But if, if you look, you can just see these trophy pieces that, as, and as, as amazing as they look on screen, there's nothing like standing in front of these to make their own case. And as I, I always say in talking about this, this is a story about the paintings. You know, me, I'm just a guy, my wife, we're just, you know, we're a, a photographer and a poet who do pretty good stuff from Lake Tahoe. And, uh, you know, that's our day job. Um, but these things deserve uh, the recognition they deserve, you know, the the scrutiny that they're going to get, and for people to finally go, well, duh, of course they're Pollock. It's just a pain in the ass that the politics are so intense, and the market and everything else. Um, but it kind of uh, that's Pollock, <laughs> right? So, well, JT, I again, I really appreciate your time, and uh, I really do encourage people. To, to check out your site and to get out there and see them in person if, if they ever have an opportunity. So uh, next week, LA Art Show, uh, if folks uh, show up with a mask, they can uh, come with a, a magnifying glass in hand and, and uh, you know, be That's a judge so for themselves, right? And, and at the end of the day, it's what Pollock said. He's like, I don't care about, you know, museums, curators, I just want people to look at my work. I want to enjoy it. And, you know, that's how we present it. It's just simple, clean. It's like, here, that's just you wanted. It didn't need a fancy place. Um, but these paintings, you know, would thrive in a fancy place in the sense that, you know, once it gets put together, a touring show of this around the world for a couple of years, I guarantee you it will be one of the most uh, highly attended art events and enjoy it. I mean, the fun thing. It's like, wow, it's just beautiful if you can just separate a little bit from the intensity of the politics, the money, the influence, the history. If you can separate a little bit from that and just enjoy them as a visual experience, they really, really are cool. And, and in closing, just want to say thank you for giving the paintings the platform and furthering because this is a, it's a process, it's a discussion. So thank you for allowing us to further the discussions and I look forward to, to future, you know, talks with you and, and following this story. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. All right, JT.
That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to Art Sense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. If you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read a transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. Thank you.